Uh, delighted to see you all here. Uh, part of one of the great fun things around Stanford generally and particularly around the law school uh, reunion weekend. Uh, and uh, especially nice to do it in this room. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with this room from years back, I guess. Oh my gosh. I was, uh, if I can diverge for just a second, I think, so I was a law student here and I think I was probably a class of 79, which might have been the second class that spent all three years in this new building, and some of you recall the older one in the quad. And so this room had been here for 45 years or something like that, and it was huge as it is now, but it was rather here. It sort of looked like the empty bleachers uh, after you know the home team was losing and everybody went home and all that, uh, and it wasn't very functional. And then the idea was to make it modular, uh, to have really nice and audio vision, all that. And uh, the room was just fabulous. And we'll see some of the features of it today, but there are others, OK? And anyway, uh, I'm just delighted for that. We're going to hear from uh, about and from some of our very distinguished alums in a little while. And you'll hear about them soon. Uh, but my main job is to just note the very specific uh, occasion for this particular event, which is to celebrate the great work of uh, Professor Bill Gould. Uh, I, I could say a lot about Bill. Uh, we have been friends for about well, 30, 40,000 years, OK? Uh, and uh, we've been really good friends, as, and I've always felt the same way about his fabulous wife, Hilda, who brings British grace and common sense to the world. Uh, and I was actually a uh, bill student in labor law. I don't know if he remembers that. I think I passed the course because I guess I'm still here. But uh, when I was here, Bill was already established as certainly America's leading labor law scholar and also leading, in my view, labor law public servant in many ways. Uh, some of which, of course, uh, occurred before he started teaching with his work in the unions. But of course, it all continued uh, during his academic years. Uh, we were all uh, excited uh, when President Clinton picked him to run uh, the NLRB. So we missed him for a couple of years, but he, we knew he was coming back. Uh, and uh, just a quick historical note, uh, and that is that I, I, I'm sure Bill takes some pleasure in, in that the often uh, the, the common view that labor unions, the whole union movement was fading away, needs a little correction now because we live in an interesting time when unions are achieving a lot more significance, a lot more energy, a lot more influence. And you know, I think Bill himself deserves a lot of credit for that because he has been so much part of the DNA uh, of the movement. He's also been my very close friend. For some reason, many years ago, he started calling me Bobby W., which yeah, I kind of like because it makes me feel younger. And then I started calling him Billy G. So <laughs> anyway, and uh, on, on the lighter side, but actually also on the professional side, uh, Bill and I share the view that with all that's going on in the world, the sports world is a place of great solace, although complexity. And of course, in Bill's case, he's lucky. I can just play, you know, uh, you know, silly sports fan. But he has a significant professional role with respect to sports and labor issues, and that's a very significant part of American life right now. And I, I think it's uh, even gotten more so. So just to say that 50 years, I think, have gone by pretty quickly for Bill's fabulous career here, and he's still at it. And I hope he continues because I think we'll all benefit from it. So let me just say. Uh, we'll hear more, but thank you to, for Bill for being here still. So thank you. And now I get, oh, oh, okay, so uh, I'm going to in a, soon, I guess, well, maybe now, passing things over to uh, some of our guests who will be introduced and then speak. But first, taking advantage of this wonderful room, uh, we're going to see uh, and hear uh, a great video with wonderful messages from people with long, fond relationships with Stanford Law School. So turn on the show. Really, it all boils down to the Red Sox, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
As Jack Vance Shaughnessy wrote many times, everything in life comes back to the Red Sox. Whenever I've gone to see him, one of the first things he asks is like, Mark, can we go to a ball game? Or can we figure out a time to go to a ball game? Take you to a ball game? Um, because he very much enjoys that kind of human interaction. I will wear this, but only for you, Bill. He's the only person I know who takes the score, has a scorecard, and and uh, actually records every out, every pitch. Yeah, his knowledge of baseball, Red Sox uh, history and lore is encyclopedic. It just he has every relevant statistic about them. And, and I thought I was a big Ted Williams fan, and I thought I knew put me to shame. I'm getting emails from him very early in the day and very late in the evening. And this has always been true since I met him in 1991. I don't know when he finds time to sleep, but he's always got stuff going on. So for me, he's just like the Energizer Bunny. If you walk into his office, it's a little bit messy, I think. And you'll ask him about something, he'll go, hmm. over, over there, in, in that pile over there, about halfway down, you'll find a case and, and it will exactly be where he points to it. I could always count on enjoying my visit with him because I knew there would be some good jazz on. You know, he's so smart, but he, you know, he, he's funny too, and he's just absolutely fun to talk to, to be around. Um, you know, ceaselessly kind. Pleasant, but, but not a dictator type. Uh, know-it-all attitude, but you know there's a whole lot more <laughs> in that brain than he's even telling us. Welcoming and generous with his time, which he was then, and he has been multiple times since then, as I've been working as a labor lawyer, there have been times when I've, you know, kind of reached a point where I'm stuck in my research or my analysis, and I've thought, well, why don't I call the former chairman of the NLRB? Grandfatherly? Uh, and supportive. Top of line adjectives are generous, uh, hopeful, caring, and active. Engaged, because when you talk to him, he's engaged in so many things in the world. Present, when you talk to him, he is there. You know, he pays attention. He's, even though he's got a million things going on, he pays attention to you. He is very kind. His curiosity is something that feeds that energy. It's, it is part of what made him who he was in the beginning, but also keeps him young now in his early 80s. Professional side, uh, passionate and indefatigable, and on the uh, personal side, warm-hearted and loyal. When Bill Gould gets to work on something, he really pushes to the end and uh, do doesn't you know let things go and just drop things. He, he's really just such a persistent person. He, he was always very encouraging, and you could tell that he was always interested in um, helping you get to where you wanted to be. Uh, I don't remember going to him asking for things. For example, I'm going to L.A., uh, do you know people there? He offered. He acted, but he wasn't profuse. He wasn't, he was more silent in terms of the kind of support. And I was only in two of his classes, but uh, he made a, a huge impact on me as a student and um, really as a human being. Bill always thought of something and that always conveyed his love of labor law, his concern for students, and his engagement as a scholar and teacher. You know, other than Thurgood Marshall and a few others who were very prominent, you did not have a lot of example of successful African-American lawyers. So I get to law school and lo and behold, there's Bill. Oh my God. Bill represented what could be for me and I dare say others like me in my class who had not seen a lot of examples of success. I think whirlwind of ideas is, is, a, is a great phrase to describe him in part because yeah, you know, he wasn't someone who taught labor law as a static subject where all these principles were settled and there was nothing new happening. He, I think, correctly saw labor law as a dynamic field that's always changing. I, I think we worked well together because we really shared a love of sports, family, and the truth. Um, and I think those those are things that really encapsulate a lot of what sort of 
drives Bill and what he's he's passionate about. Bill was my mentor. I mean, I really stayed in touch with him. And he says, well, have you ever thought about teaching? I said, no. And he says, well, let me scout around and see if there are any openings. I went ahead and took the plunge and then the rest is history. I fell in love with it. I would not be a teacher today were it not for Bill. He, he has a combination of, of intellect, combination of, 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 uh, of law and also uh, of, of feelings that he that he trusts and can and knows how to convey, um, you know, his feelings to you, but back it up, you know, in rhetoric and back it up in 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 legally. And there are very few people that I know, you know, that have all those qualities. I'll use a, a, a baseball analogy. He's a triple threat. In baseball, that means you can hit, run, and feel clearly. Uh, you know, one of the, the, the best labor law researchers and, and teachers in our uh, uh, field. I use the Jackie Robinson analogy. Someone like Bill that comes in and is the real deal. You know, he's, he's a scholar. No one questions it. His scholarship is impeccable. Uh, it's, it's voluminous an outstanding faculty person in every way that, uh, you know, he said, oh, about, we didn't know that there were people like that out there. He opened the door that everybody learned from him. The, 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 the rest of the faculty at the school, the students saw uh, what they were capable of doing through Bill, opening that door so wide and so effectively. So my name is Alan Pick. I am a graduate of Stanford Law School, class of 1970, and I am proud and privileged to be part of this participation in the celebration of Professor William Gould IV. Uh, Bill is just uh, is filled with amazing stories. He has, over the last 50 years, mentored and educated literally thousands of students at Stanford Law School. We know that he is a leading scholar of labor and employment discrimination law and has taught literally thousands of people about that. He's amazingly prolific. He's written 11 books and he's in the midst of writing his 12th book at this time. He has written innumerable articles and commentaries about labor law and about employment discrimination law. Stanford Law School was founded in 1893, and up until 1972, every professor at Stanford Law School had been a white male. And because of Dean Tom Ehrlich and Mike Wald, who are here today, is that they made a decision that it was important to diversify the faculty of Stanford Law School. And that's when Bill joined the law school and changed the law school forever. Uh, in 1995, when Bill was chairman of the National Labor Relations Board and the baseball strike was an existential threat to the continuation of Major League Baseball, as head of the NLRB, Bill stepped in found powers of the NLRB that had never been used and uh, was able to save baseball. And the amazing thing is, is that Bill not only did this and all of this in the past tense, but that Bill continues to do it to this day. He's still teaching classes here. He's still reading art, writing articles. He still appears on television, uh, at radio, in the press, in commenting on labor law and employment discrimination law. And so we are all honored to be able to join in this celebration. So I would like to introduce Dean John Casvilla to tell us more about Bill. Thank you. Thank you.
you, Alan. When I was first uh, asked to uh, speak about Professor Gould, I thought to myself, WWCS, what would chat GPT say? <laughs> but um, from, our time in, from our time in Washington, the, the, the State of the Union address, when the House of Representatives is functioning, <laughs> the president goes before the House and Senate, and the House Sergeant at Arms calls out, Mr. Speaker or Madam Speaker, I have the high privilege and distinct honor to present the President of the United States, who we've seen a few of pictures of a few of them up there who are associates of Bill. But I feel that way today. Uh, it is truly a high privilege and a distinct honor to be before you uh, to share my thoughts and my profound admiration and respect uh, for Professor Bill Gould. As students and, and alums, there's little more that we could do to honor our professors and our school beyond passing the bar the first time, using our legal training in sound and ethical ways, and giving back to our community through pro bono and, uh, and other ways, pro bono services and other ways. So I'm especially grateful for this opportunity to share a few minutes about how Professor Gould stands for what I believe in and have aspired to as a lawyer, public official, educator, and community member. In the fall of my second year at the law school, I took his labor law course. That was in the fall of 1981. Now, if you ask Bill about it, he would automatically and quickly say, the Dodgers beat the Yankees in the series four to two, and let me get Dusty on the phone. He can tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, but to me, that's where I learned about donning and doffing. Obviously, not everybody in here is in labor law, unless they, that would be a laugh line. <laughs> <laughs> I, I enjoyed labor law, and I also took another labor law course with him. But where I would say what his, his teaching at the law school was way beyond just, just in the classroom. Uh, after that course, I went to hear him speak on campus uh, on, to talk about the Voting Rights Act. It was a, it was a uh, program that Professor Clay Carson was sponsoring. It was in January of 1982. That predates the National Martin Luther King Day, but it was it, but it was in, uh, in honor of, of his day. And much to my surprise, Professor Gould said he had been reading about me. Well, during my 1L summer, I, I was interning for MALDEF in Washington, D.C., and I testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee on extension of the Voting Rights Act bilingual election provisions. So in preparation for his campus talk, he had read over the hearing transcript and noticed my testimony. So we connected on those issues and just a start of so many other connections uh, on, on various things. Uh, when I came to Stanford for law school, I was greatly looking for that type of connection to the outside world. The law school attracted students from around the country. But in general, the campus was comfortable, was suburban, kind of detached, so much so that I recall eating in Wilbur Hall, um, and the students were so upset when President Reagan and John Paul II were shot. But they weren't upset about that. They were upset that the TV stations preempted the Gilligan's Island reruns at, at dinner time. So by contrast, in his classes describing labor disputes, talking about the issues of the day, talking about working men and women. Bill Gould, more than any professor I had, provided that reminder to me as to why I was in law school and the purpose behind all the readings and writings and other academic work. But years later, going through a lot of stuff, a lot of papers in, in my family, I found that previous to my entering law school in 1979, uh, Bill and I were on a, in a full-page ad as concerned Californians wanting Ted Kennedy to run for, uh, for president against, against Jimmy, Jimmy Carter. So we had this connection even before I knew it. But Bill offer, offers ever-present reminders of why we as lawyers do what we do. And that should be the hallmark for any professor. I was dean for a few years at the University of San Francisco School of Law, and every quarter, professors would provide me reports on where they had written, what law review article they were in, et cetera. And 
well, that was great. I was more interested in who's using that scholarship? What courts are citing it? What advocates are talking to them about, about developing and shaping the law? And what journalists might be turning to them, talking about, asking them to explain to average people, to, 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 to the people, about, about complex Supreme Court rulings and other legal developments. Having an impact, and that's exactly the Bill Gold standard. It's done well by other professors, to be sure, but no law professor I have had has had such a long-lasting impact on my professional direction and sense of purpose than Bill, so I am grateful. During the Clinton administration, while I was at the Department of Justice, I served as special counsel for immigration-related unfair employment practices. I had the longest title of the department, but in essence, it was leading the office, the only office in the federal government, devoted solely to immigrant workplace rights. And Bill, of course, chaired the NLRB. Now, every administration talks about interagency cooperation. Well, Bill meant it. He recognized that immigrant workers on the margins were exploited, were underpaid, and often not paid at all and that unscrupulous employers could try to play the immigration card against them to keep workers from organizing. Well, Bill cut the red tape, and he got our staffs, my staff and his staff, to collaborate. So after his time at NLRB ended, our agencies came together, along with the EEOC, to establish written protocols and cross-training so our respective offices, not just in Washington, but at the regional level as well, knew and respected what each other did, referred matters where the other agency could be of more help and may have had jurisdiction and collaborate and at least not interfere with each other. One day, Senator Paul Wallstone, someone else you've seen in the pictures today, put us to the test. Housekeepers at the Minneapolis Holiday Inn Express had been taken away and threatened with deportation as they were going into uh, to what they thought was a bargaining, bargaining session. Instead of getting a bargaining session, the employer had called INS on them. Talk about bad faith. NLRB was already involved. Senator Wellstone asked us and the EEOC to join in. Because of the collaboration, because of the, the infrastructure that Bill had put in and we had put in, the agencies that worked together, the, house, the housekeepers at the hotel got their union, they got back pay, and they were protected from, from deportation. They got, they got temporary relief. That type of collaboration for people would not have been possible without Bill putting it in, promoting it, and inspiring it. For Bill and for me, our work to enforce the laws we administered gave voice to the otherwise voiceless. It might never have occurred to the powerful person or institution discriminating against someone, taking away their job, or depriving them of their rights. It wouldn't have occurred to them so there was a government agency that protected that individual, and that government agencies was, was accessible, would answer the phone, and would follow up, and would investigate, and get them their rights. That's what Bill Gould made possible. Long before Shohei Otani, Bill excelled at playing different positions and fulfilling different roles exceedingly well. He's a professor and a teacher, a public servant, and he's also been called upon to be a mediator because he has a reputation for being a strong and principled advocate who is fair and trusted by both sides. We all know lawyers who take controversy and make it about themselves. Bill Gould observes controversy and brings the volume and temperature down a bit, allows all sides to focus in on the problem and the dispute. When that requires taking on the institutions that are supposed to help people and don't, the people win out in Bill's view. He calls on courage and truth to remind all of us about our responsibilities for service to clients, to communities, and to country. Bill was also helpful to me when I went back to Washington, D.C. in the Obama administration as HUD Assistant Secretary for Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity. When I received my briefing on fair lending, uh, disparate impact, and other parts of, of, of the fair housing laws, very quick mention was some, there was very quick mention of something called Section 3 of the HUD Act. In principle, Section 3 says that HUD is spending money. The money goes to companies or, or contractors that hire people in public housing or hire low-income individuals. 
And Section 3 had been neglected by past administration of both parties. And I was informed, well, you don't really have to focus on it. It's not really about housing. <clears throat> but it was everything about the people in public housing. And that's where Bill was so helpful, advising us, advising me in particular, on project labor agreements and ways to make Section 3 work better. It might not have been about the buildings, but it was certainly about the people who live there. It's always about the people. Once again, making laws work for people, getting lawyers and public officials to focus on the human aspects of laws and policies. Over these many years, 40 for me since, the law, since graduating, 50 since you began teaching at the law school, Bill has opened doors, has opened minds, and opened hearts. For countless students and lawyers of all backgrounds, for countless workers, causes, responsibilities, and roles, he has been a guide for justice. For decades, the Boston, his beloved Boston Red Sox had Tom Yawkey Way until they changed their name very appropriately. Now here at Stanford and everywhere he goes, the one I follow is the Bill Gould Way. It doesn't need to be renamed, but should be followed. So thank you, Professor Gould, for always being a pennant winner. Thank you, John. And now I am privileged and proud to present Dean Adrian Wayne. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, you'll have to excuse my voice. Uh, I, uh, I was in Kenya last month and got pneumonia, and uh, I don't have pneumonia now, <laughs> but my voice has not come back. Well, I think what I'm going to say will be in harmony with uh, what Dean Trasvina said. I'm very honored to have been asked to speak, to be the voice of many of Bill's students <clears throat> over the decades. I met him when I was a 1L in 1979. <clears throat> I had had a couple of black professors at Princeton where I did my undergrad, and they had been mentors to me. So I was very excited to arrive at Stanford and hear, there's a black professor. So I sought him out. I was so excited to meet him. And I've been asked to speak, uh, bringing up the issue of diversity writ large, uh, because Bill's uh, career exemplifies the very best of that. Having a black professor is not just good for black students, it's good for white students. <clears throat> if you don't, if a white person never sees a black person as a lawyer or professor or judge, subconsciously they may think, oh, well, those people, they don't do that. And that's very dangerous for our society. So having Bill as the first black professor and him being that for many years, he was here alone as a black faculty member. He was joined by Professor Mendez his running buddy, who was the first Latino, but he was here for many years. And as we know, of course, today, the very notion of diversity is under attack. We cannot take for granted the gains that we made back then, that they will continue. Now, the importance of diversity at a super elite institution like Stanford Law School is even more important. Some of you may have spent your whole career in elite institutions. I have spent the last 37 years as a law professor at the University of Iowa Law School. It's been wonderful. I am educating 
students, most of whom are first generation college, much less law school. Our mission is to serve the state, not necessarily the whole nation. And some of my students may not have gone further than Chicago. None of them, pretty much none of them attended an elite college. We don't have the resources of a school like Stanford. And as we know, what Stanford does gets in the national media. <laughs> and we are producing at Stanford people who are going to be governing and participating at the very highest levels of American and global society. So having Bill Gould come into the institution when he did was truly revolutionary. There were very few black professors then at any majority white school. We do have five black, predominantly black law schools. We call them HBCUs. And of course they had majority black faculties, but not any majority white school. Many people may not know, Bill came from Wayne State. He did not start his teaching career at Stanford. He had attended Cornell Law School, but he had not worked big law Wall Street or clerked for a federal judge. These are qualifications that then were considered de rigueur if you wanted to be a law professor. And even today, many schools, especially very elite ones, may seek those credentials. And I'm sure when he was hired, there must have been some people who wondered, <coughs> is he going to make it? Does he have what it takes? I hope now, if any of those people are alive, they would look and think, yeah, I guess he's made it. <laughs> he wasn't alone in that, that year, revolutionary as it was. They also hired the first woman. Barbara Babcock. She didn't have that classic profile either because women couldn't have been in those big firms or clerking either. I was honored to have her as my professor as well as Deborah Rohde who came right after her. Now I want to mention, this is where I'm, I'm intersecting with the prior speaker, the areas where Bill has been a role model since he hit the ground running, and uh, from time to time he has run. <laughs> and that is as a teacher, scholar, practitioner, mentor, and race man. As a teacher, you've already heard, he's taught thousands of people. He introduced sports law to the curriculum and an employment law seminar to the curriculum. One of the advantages of having a diverse faculty is, oh, they might have some diverse ideas about courses that others haven't taught. You've heard that he's a fabulous scholar, 11 books, more than 60 articles. If he had done that along with nothing else, that would be truly extraordinary. And yet he's continuing to publish well into his 80s very calmly, I, I, I go in that office, that's a bit of a mess, looking for where's the leprechauns or where are the people that are <laughs> produ helping produce this incredible body of work. Many professors stay in their ivory tower <clears throat> writing and teaching. Bill has been engaged in what we call praxis, the intersection of theory and practice his whole career. When he joined the Wayne State faculty in 1968, he was incredibly bold. <laughs> he said, I want to have time to represent clients. And he has done that all of these years. And you know all the institutions that he's worked with as a practitioner, as a mediator. I mean, when I heard 300 disputes that you are, I mean, that alone, that is, uh, it would be enough without the professing. 
So in that area, of course, not only was he head of the NLRB, right, but also the California Agricultural Labor Relations Board. I said, how are you going up there? Oh, I get on the train, I go up. What? <laughs> it was amazing that he had the energy to do this. Bill has been an amazing mentor to many people. I'm sure many of you in this room, I don't know you all, practitioners, policymakers, and professors. So I'm just going to call out some of the professors beside myself. We have in the house Professor Ken Shropshire, class of 80, who spent most of his career at the Wharton School, and he is an expert in sports law. Just wave your hand. Trump, we also have here, you saw him in the film, Professor Gary Williams, class of 76, from Loyola, specializes civil rights law. Wave, Gary. <laughs> now, Bill came to Iowa many times since I've been on the faculty there. He would do a talk for us, all my faculty, they were like, oh, this is so exciting. How did you get Bill Gold to come? Well, you know, we have something in Iowa that none of y'all got anywhere else. What is it? And I don't mean the Iowa caucuses. <laughs> we got the field of dreams. <laughs> we got the field of dreams. <laughs> So I would visit Stanford almost every year for a talk or something, and every year I would come, Bill and I would have a lunch or a dinner or a coffee, almost ever since I graduated in 1982. <coughs> Finally, Bill has been what black people call a race man. Some of you may have never heard of this term. While everything he has done has helped every type of person among the people who have benefited a lot from his efforts have been black people, articles, books that he has written. And to me, the triumph is the book about William Gould I, his great grandfather who escaped from slavery and subsequently enlisted in the Navy to fight against the Confederacy. Bill was quoted as saying, it's perfectly proper to infuse the struggle for equality with patriotism and to be supportive of the United States. That's the way he was, that's the way all my forebears were, and that's what I believe. William Gould IV, has been an exemplar in all his roles. The very essence of excellence at this institution for more than 50 years. Stanford just now tenured its first black woman, Rabia Belt. She could not be with us today. Also in the audience, there is a 1L, a young man I just met named Justin. Wave, Justin, so they see a 1L. <laughs> you all remember being this age? <laughs> Thank you for coming. I hope that 50 years from now, Professor Belt will have been able to influence young students like Justin and all those who will come after him for the length of time that Bill Gould has influenced so many of us. In conclusion, Bill and I were both involved in the anti-apartheid movement. You saw a picture of him with the late Nelson Mandela, the first black president. Nelson Mandela thought he was in prison. He thought it might be his life. And he said, the struggle is my life. Bill Gould has exemplified this <clears throat> in the struggle for justice. Bill was quoted in an article as saying, I think that the answer for young people and the answer from all of us is what Bill Gould I did in the 1860s, to put one shoulder to the wheel and try to move this society in the best way possible. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Adrian. <laughs> Bill, light up here. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Bill, come over here first. <clears throat> Those of you who know Bill at all know that Bill is one of the biggest baseball fans that there possibly can be. And that what, what do you want to say? I'll let you be right here. Right here, okay. I'll do anything you say. <laughs> <laughs> Great opportunity to boss Bill to Bill, why don't you come up here for a minute? I want to make a presentation oh, okay. to you. So one of Bill's <coughs> closest friends in the world is Dusty Baker, uh, the future Hall of Fame baseball manager and the manager of the Houston Astros who won the World Series last year. Dusty couldn't be with us today, although he wanted. He is here in spirit, but this afternoon the Astros are playing the Rangers in the National League <coughs> Championship Series, and that took precedent. But, but Dusty is here not only in spirit, but... I can think you got a good number there, number 50. <laughs> and I guess we gave the number on these bobbleheads for Bill, the number 50, which is kind of a numerical pun, because Bill's favorite baseball player is Mookie Betts playing for the Dodgers. And also, this is Bill's 50th year at Stanford Law School. So Dusty sends his best greetings and his likeness. So thank you. Thank you. Bill thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as we were putting the program together, we interviewed scores of associates of Bill, and including many of his former students. And many of his former students have now retired. <laughs> Bill, <laughs> on the other hand, <laughs> taught them, is still full steam ahead, doing all of the things that he's done, but doing them with the same energy and same focus and same purpose. And so the question that I have from all of us to you, Bill, is how did you discover the fountain of youth? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, Alan, in truth, I'm, uh, I'm still, uh, like many of us are, looking for that fountain of youth. And uh, I try to, I'm not sure that I uh, pursue all these things with the same uh, energy and uh, um, uh, et cetera, that, that I did uh, uh, previously. But I think that uh, I do my best. And, I, and of course, the, the subject is, uh, is as interesting to me uh, as it was when I first came in. You, you uh, uh, referred to, uh, uh, Bob Weisberg referred to the revival of uh, sorts uh, that uh, uh, the labor movement has had. And uh, it's a very exciting uh, uh, a challenging uh, period that we we are in right now, and so uh, uh, I'm just uh, as uh, excited as uh, ever, uh, notwithstanding my continued search. <laughs> so, Bill, uh, you are well known for having great concern for working people and their needs, and the importance of their ability to organize. How did you enter this career? Well, I, I got, uh, got involved because of, uh, when I was a senior in high school, uh, a very important Supreme Court decision came down, uh, Brown against Board of Education. I had had no contact, nobody in my family, on my father and mother's side uh, had, were, were, uh, were lawyers, had any contact with the law. And, uh, uh, the uh, Brown uh, uh, Thurgood Marshall's uh, uh, great uh, success on May 17, 1954, just as I was about to graduate from high school, uh, uh, really uh, uh, caught my uh, caught my attention. Um, the uh, the the confluence was uh, also the uh, 
McCarthy Army hearings were going on that spring, and my father was employed at Fort Monmouth, uh, which McCarthy had targeted. Uh, and I began to see that uh, it was uh, important for uh, lawyers to uh, play a role in, uh, in society in that respect as well. Um, and uh, all of these things made me uh, interested in, uh, in uh, initially I wanted to work for the NAACP, uh, but I discovered very quickly that uh, uh, the Thurgood Marshall had a staff of four people there was no such thing as civil rights law uh, at that time. Uh, Brown was, uh, of course, this lonely group of, uh, of uh, uh, lawyers, uh, uh, Charles Houston being one of them, uh, were, had battled on and produced uh, uh, Brown. We had Chief Justice Warren come here when Tom, was, Tom Rose was dean, and uh, one of these pictures uh, uh, shows that. And, and so I, I became interested in... Um, uh, uh, trying to uh, translate this uh, uh, interest into uh, uh, something beyond being on the staff of the NAACP. And I found at that time that uh, the industrial unions in particular uh, seemed to espouse uh, principles of racial equality. Uh, I became uh, very much interested in, uh, and, I, and I had... I worked, I was represented by some of the CIO unions when I worked as a laborer, and uh, I, uh, uh, so I had it in my mind that uh, maybe this was the way to, uh, this is the way to go. This is the way I could realize uh, uh, some of these, uh, some of these uh, goals. And as Dean uh, Wing pointed out, you not only were an academic, uh, but you were a practitioner. And one of the most important cases in your career, and a landmark case, was the Detroit Edison case. Can you tell us about the role in your career of that case? Yeah, you know, that was a case that uh, arose uh, uh, when I was on the faculty at Wayne State. Um, I was very friendly with uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, called, uh, called Moak, Jack Moak. I represented him. I began to... Uh, do some, I probably did uh, at Wayne State as I was in court as much as I was when I was in private practice. And I represented Jack, actually, when he wanted to get on the ballot. Jack, uh, uh, after the upheavals of 1967-68, uh, Jack was involved in New Detroit, which was trying to uh, uh, see if they could uh, extrapolate from uh, all these terrible things that had happened in the 60s uh, some uh, avenue to, to uh, redress uh, grievances. And uh, a bunch of workers from Detroit Edison came to see Jack, and uh, uh, he said, they, they said, we, we're being discriminated against in a number of respects. He said, well, I got a colleague you should go and see. And he uh, had them come to see me at the law school. And I really didn't want to get involved in this because I had a lot of things uh, going on at that time. But they sat there and uh, uh, set forth for me uh, really uh, uh, a list of uh, everything that I was discussing in my seminar that I had just created in employment discrimination law. I had acted as a consultant for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the mid-60s and everything that we were dealing with, these guys were talking about. And so they kept coming back, and I agreed to uh, represent them. And uh, uh, I, I began to see this case as maybe a vehicle to uh, establish important remedies. Law professors, we, we are very much interested in the case law, the circumstances under which liability can be imposed, that's terribly important. But around this time, I be, was becoming very much interested in effective remedies uh, for uh, fair employment practice law. And I thought that uh, maybe this was a case which would be a vehicle to do that. And we uh, uh, tried the case over a substantial period of time. and. Uh, uh, the district judge, Judge Damon Keith in Detroit, uh, awarded us uh, uh, 
uh, so-called front pay as well as back pay, that is to compensate the workers for losses that they would incur while they were being wait, while they had to wait to be promoted into jobs that they should have had in the first instance. And he also fashioned uh, punitive damages remedies, and we got various kinds of equitable relief. Um, well, you know, it was like a, uh, uh, it was a, it, it was, this was a very exciting period of time. We went to the Court of Appeals to the Sixth Circuit. The Edison, of course, appealed, cut back on some of the remedies, took our punitive damages away. Uh, but uh, I often thought that uh, they just couldn't write fast enough to take away everything mm -hmm. that we had obtained at the uh, district court level. And uh, ultimately, uh, we got a settlement for uh, uh, in excess of uh, for 100 people, 400 people, in excess of $5 million, which at that time was the highest per capita judgment ever, ever obtained uh, in an employment discrimination uh, a case. So we, we um, were very fortunate. My, uh, the American Civil Liberties Union, my friend Mel Wolf, who was the uh, legal director, financed us. He said, now he said, uh, we're going we're gonna to pay your way, because I was operating by myself, then I brought a couple of other people in. No way could we sustain a case like that with these guys who had no money. And uh, he took care of us, and he said, there's only one catch to my proposal. If you prevail and you get attorney's fees, uh, uh, you have to give them to me. And, <laughs> and we got them. We got, we got a quarter of a million dollars, which was big money at that time. And uh, uh, they, the ACLU uh, uh, got it. So uh, every, I, think, uh, I think we were able to make some progress along with other people who had uh, who were taking cases like this up at that time. This was the 1970s. It took a decade to bring this to conclusion. It was a long period. Started at Wayne State, continued here at Stanford. I would fly out from San Francisco to Detroit, argue all day the next day. Uh, I was, uh, that's, something, that's something I can't do today, uh, uh, Adrian. And, and uh, uh, but I, I would get in my hotel 11 o'clock at night, argue all day, the following day. Uh, and uh, we were able to, I like to think we were able to accomplish some good through that and perhaps some ancillary cases that came about as a result of that. So, so when Bill says that there's things, things that he could do before that he can't do now, he's lying. <laughs> because when we have had to set up meetings over the last year and putting this together, the person who we always had the hardest time of tying down in his busy schedule to meet with us by Zoom was Bill. He was always doing something. And uh, as I said, he still has that same energy. So after practicing, he then became a professor at Wayne State and then a professor at Stanford Law School, and how did you decide to become a professor, and, and how did it impact your career when you came here to Stanford? Well, um, I decided to, I hadn't really planned on uh, <coughs> being a professor. Uh, Adrian was pointing out that, that I didn't really fit the uh, uh, criteria. Um, uh, but uh, I had had, uh, I was doing a lot of writing, I was writing for, uh, uh, I was writing for a lot of law journals. I was writing, I had ideas about my subject. Uh, and uh, I was writing a series of law journal articles at that point. Also, I was writing for uh, periodicals, sometimes uh, involving uh, uh, civil rights law, sometimes involving politics for magazines like Commonweal, the Roman Catholic magazine, The New Leader, and The New Republic. I think they showed a my check, the first check I ever got. Uh, they paid me, I think, $15 for the for my first publication when I reviewed Alan's, uh, Alan Payton's uh, uh, Hope for South Africa, who wrote those two great novels uh, before it. And I just, uh, as if they didn't know me, and I just wrote this piece and sent it in. And so that led to, so, so uh, I got a call uh, 
out of the blue, really, uh, uh, of course, uh, the cities were burning and uh, uh, institutions were now suddenly interested in finding uh, black academics, uh, whereas, uh, and so they, they're looking beyond the traditional criteria. And um, uh, I, uh, I got a call out of the blue uh, from uh, an assistant dean at Wayne State Law School, and I remember saying to Hilda that uh, my wife Hilda, who's, I said, you know, there's just no way that uh, I had a lot of pals in Detroit, uh, uh, most to, even today, mo you know, probably a plurality of my friends are in Detroit, and about from my UA, my first job was with the United Auto Workers in Detroit. I said, but there's no way I'll, I'll do that. But then I went out there and they said, you know, you can, you can teach what you want, you can write, you can arbitrate, you can represent people in court. And, well, I, I, and, and, and at that time, yeah, you know, there wasn't this vast financial gulf between uh, academic and law practice. And, and um, so I, we, we decided we went out there. And, uh, and then I got another call. I went, went, I visited at Harvard in the fall of 71. And uh, as soon as I sat down at my desk, I got a call from uh, a fellow who uh, named Mark Franklin, who was on the faculty here for a number of years. So I think he was chairman of the committee. And uh, he said, we'd like you to come out and talk to us. And I think I'd only been to California twice in my life at that point. I really, my, my father had been out here uh, uh, out to California a number of times so during the war, uh, he, my father, uh, set up the um, set up the uh, uh, radar to uh, guard against uh, 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 Japanese uh, incursions, and uh, he went up and down the coast of California. He knew it pretty well. I talked to him about it, and we just, we came out here and we met uh, a number of people. We met uh, a guy who's. Jim Danaher, as you, you may recall, who was a graduate of the law school, terrific guy, wonderful guy, and uh, became very, uh, you know, I was really uh, very much taken with it. And uh, uh, Tom Ehrlich, uh, the, the, was the dean, and uh, Tom was uh, very much uh, was interested in uh, in me, and and uh, I felt very supportive and and supportive when I came here, and so we. Uh, we uh, uh, we came here to uh, we said you know this is uh, this seems like a great place we, we and we uh, bought our house down on 711 Salvatierra a couple of blocks here from the law school and we've been here ever ever since. <laughs> this is great being being with you, Bill, and I'm Dick Morningstar, Alan's classmate from the class of '70. Alan, you want to give him your microphone? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we have. It's fallen down. Yeah. This is why you couldn't hear me because of yeah. my uh, jacket. Uh, any event, uh, I had. Uh, I was saying that uh, Alan and I were classmates in class of 1970, and uh, uh, unfortunately didn't have the uh, opportunity to take Bill's classes because he came. He came after we uh, left. Uh, I get to talk about maybe the most serious part of the program, uh, sports and baseball. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, Bill, Bill and I have uh, uh, Stanford Law School in common. We have uh, uh, the Clinton administration in common. But what we have most in common <clears throat> is that I'm probably the second most fanatical, <clears throat> excuse me, Red Sox fan in the world. And uh, Bill, Bill is the first. Uh, and uh, I can say that Bill and I are probably the only people in the world, literally, who, as we did a couple of days ago, could come up with the names of Norm Zouchin and Dick Gernert in a heartbeat. Uh, <clears throat> so in any event, we have that very much in common. But I would uh, like to ask you, Bill, uh, how did you become such a sports fan, such a Red Sox fan? Uh, what is it? What has it meant? Uh, in your life, I know it's been very painful sometimes for <laughs> both of us, uh, particularly particularly this year. Uh, but uh, how did this all happen? Well, um, when I was uh, about nine, turning ten, uh, I fell in with a bunch of guys, 
and uh, we started playing baseball together. We had no uniforms. We had no. Uh, we didn't have. Uh, there were no umpires. We had. Uh, there was no. Uh, probably, there wasn't even a uniform distance between the uh, uh, bases, and we played every day, all summer, morning and afternoon. Our, our mothers made sandwiches for us, and uh, we, 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 this, was all, we were, this was all consuming. My, my father thought this was a little bit out of control, uh, <laughs> uh, because, because we had, not only we play every day, play all summer, but uh, we, uh, we uh, uh, began to become interested in, began to, we, read, we were able to read about it, we, uh, uh, read the newspapers, we listened to the radio. There was no television. There was no television until a year or so later. Uh, uh, and uh, this was uh, uh, we ride on our bikes, talking about it. Um, to me, uh, baseball in particular, you know, and I know they say this about what the world calls football, what we call soccer. Baseball is the is the beautiful game. It's uh, it is. Uh, it is uh, like uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, ballet. It's it's uh, it's so uh, uh, the <coughs> the things that these guys can, the really good people can do uh, uh, out there. And there is something uh, about the ambiance. Uh, uh, you know, when my father and I uh, uh, first went, if I remember, my father took me to our first big league game that summer. Uh, we uh, we we uh, were so impressed how the cognoscenti could uh, uh, tell who the pitcher was coming in from the bullpen. You know, in that, those days nobody ran in from the bullpen. They, <laughs> they, they were too dignified. They walked in a slow, stately way, and and uh, uh, we. But the cognoscenti knew who. As the gate swung open, they knew who was coming in, and uh, the, um, uh, the the ambiance, the the way the, the motions of the uh, players, the theater, um, and the fact that the uh, game goes on forever could go on. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is you know if you read Kinsella's novels, you you see this. Uh, he makes much of this. Uh, 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 games that go on for 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 days. Then there was something else as well. Uh, I, I, I think uh, in those days, and I pity, I'm ashamed of the fact that I've lost this characteristic over the years. I was very good at math, and uh, there was another guy and I. We were a year ahead of the class. We were the teachers had us going. We had a, a year and a half ahead of where the class was in math. I loved uh, computation. I loved, and you know, I loved statistics. <laughs> well, of course, uh, and, and, you know, and you're batting average. Of course, we, I don't understand many of these new kinds of statistics that have been introduced recently. But batting average is uh, uh, just uh, an ERAs, you know. Uh, we knew why uh, ER earn run averages were so important. It was just a part of our, it was in our bones, part of our existence, and uh, uh, it was uh, all consuming. Richard. <laughs> you know, my, my wife Faith is in the audience here, and I hope you have taken to heart and you've been listening carefully. To well, Hilda, Bill my wife Hilda doesn't uh, uh, have Hilda, the same Hilda, feeling Hilda that Faith well. has. <laughs> she has the same feeling that Faith has. But, you know, your words are reminiscent, too, of you know, the late Bart Shimadi. And baseball is a beautiful game. Remember that, Faith. <laughs> um, you know, there's been a lot of talk uh, already about uh, your time at the National Labor Relations Board and, uh, and the baseball strike and that you, uh, were, as chairman, uh, led the board in bringing uh, suit for injunctive relief uh, to effectively stop, uh, stop the baseball strike. And I know some say, well, he's a baseball fan. That's why he did this. 
Well, you know, we also have to remember that the judge who granted the injunctive relief was then Judge Sotomayor, uh, which was uh, uh, which was pretty pretty impressive. Uh, but and you also became known as I think has also been I think Alan mentioned maybe some others the Banana Save Baseball. Um, well, tell us you know tell us a little bit about that experience and how you you know how you feel about maybe it'd be too modest to say that you saved the game but how you feel about all of that. Well, I, of course, I didn't save the game. I was one of the people that uh, maybe was instrumental in in. Uh, uh, bringing that strike to a conclusion in the, uh, in the spring of 1995. Uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, season really got off the tracks in 1994, the year, the year that I went to Washington uh, with the uh, players, I think, thought that uh, they could strike the owners uh, toward the end of the season and that the owners would... Uh, would uh, capitulate, and uh, much to their surprise, uh, the owners uh, uh, didn't do that, um, and they canceled the World Series for only the second time, first time since 1904 that the, <clears throat> that the World Series had been uh, had been uh, canceled. I, I, um, uh, you know, I remember I was doing some salary arbitrations in baseball before I took that job at the NLRB, and I remember saying, oh, gosh, what a shame. I'm going to have to give up all these salary arbitrations. And I was teaching the sports law course with a fellow named Leonard Coppett, who said to me, wait till you get to Washington. You're going to be right in the middle of it. Well, um, we had unfair labor practice charges filed with us by the players against the owners. And uh, uh, the, uh, the question was whether or not the... Uh, owners had uh, refused to bargain in good faith. And there's an obligation under uh, uh, federal labor law, the National Labor Relations Act, that uh, you must bargain on all mandatory subjects, so-called mandatory subjects, to the point of impasse. That way students always say, what is that? What? And, and, and what does that mean? And I try to tell them uh, some stories to uh, which we don't have time to do here. but. Uh, uh, as to what impasse means. But the uh, owners had taken the position that uh, uh, they had changed uh, certain conditions of employment. They had taken the position that the uh, uh, salary uh, arbitration was not a mandatory subject, and we found that they had refused to bargain to the point of impasse. And so we, we uh, found that they had, there was reasonable cause, to use the words of the uh, statute, to uh, find that they had bargained in bad faith. And on the basis of that, we used a provision of that, that at that time was little, little used, which gave us the authority to go into federal court. Judge, judge as she was then, Sotomayor, held in our favor, and uh, the, as did the judges uh, at the Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit when the matter was appealed later in the year. And the players came back to the field once they got that ruling, and uh, the, the season began and was continued, and uh, eventually the parties negotiated a collective bargaining agreement. Um, so we, we, I think it, it, it was a, an initiative that worked out um, uh, pretty well in the sense that it uh, got the season going and uh, gave us the baseball that we, uh, many of us want. And, uh, uh, but it, but it, uh, it was done, I think, uh, on the basis of uh, proper examination of our, uh, of our duties under the National Labor Relations Act itself. I think we're maybe beginning to run a little short on time, but let me uh, uh, ask you one more uh, sports-related question, which is your famous class in sports law and how that happened. You had coming to your class people like... Dusty Baker, Al Adams, Willie Mays actually came to one of your classes. Yes. Um, how, how did that all happen? And one of the things when we interviewed with, with Dusty, uh, he was saying that you know he learned more, uh, learned more from the class, and the class you know learned from him. Uh, and the importance of 
players who he introduced you to, seeing you as a, um, as a <coughs> prominent uh, African-American scholar and how important that was to so many people. Um, maybe you can comment uh, a little bit on that class and uh, how you felt about it and the relationships that you did make from that class. Well, that class... Uh, uh, it was something that began in the uh, mid-80s. Um, uh, a colleague of mine from uh, Wayne State and I, and he and I had much contact when I went, when I visited at Harvard, he was at Boston College. We had talked about uh, putting something like this together and writing about this. We ultimately wrote a book uh, about sports law uh, together. We, we uh, uh, taught a summer school, and uh, the first uh, cut on this was uh, a Golden Gate Law School in the summer of 1980. And um, as a result of this, we, and then I, I, I met these two other fellows uh, who had different, different strengths. Uh, uh, Leonard Coppett, this journalist, who was a sports journalist from the New York, who had been with the New York Times. Alvin Adels, who had been... Uh, you know, uh, a great basketball player for the uh, Golden State Warriors and uh, uh, their coach, uh, who uh, coached them to a championship in the mid-70s. Uh, and uh, were very different looking and acting people. And uh, any of you who have ever seen uh, either Mr. Coppett or, or, or uh, Mr. Adels, although Adels, Al and I were the exact same we used to call each other twins because we're the exact same, uh, exact same age. So we, we put together um, uh, a lot of materials on, uh, on labor, you know, uh, the, initially the antitrust cases were very important, the contract cases. Labor began to become important in large part initially due to the baseball players, the, uh, the, the arbitration system that they put into effect. Uh, so we put all these materials together, and we had a cast of uh, thousands. We had a cast of many guest lecturers. One of them was uh, uh, we had we had uh, uh, Larry Whiteside from the Boston Globe. Uh, we had uh, Bill Duffy, the uh, uh, sports uh, agent. We had Dusty come. Dusty Baker has been in the seminar a number of times, and uh, we had Bill Walsh. Uh, uh, who came in, uh, who was just uh, really terrific. Uh, uh, the baseball coach, the Stanford baseball coach, uh, Mark Marcus, who became a good pal. And, uh, and one day we had Willie Mays, and uh, you know the uh, electricity kind of went through the law school uh, that day. And Willie was, uh, 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 Willie, was Willie, and uh, he said things, some things that... Uh, I couldn't say, or the, the good, my good deans would have me dismissed. But 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 uh, but he uh, he was great, and um, uh, I think the uh, students uh, enjoyed it because it brought together uh, uh, the technical material, the the uh, the labor law, the antitrust, the contract, with uh, real live personalities that they were familiar with uh, from from afar. So, Bill, uh, in your 50 years at Stanford Law School, you have educated and mentored so many students. And the students that we talked to in preparing for this will talk about how you made them find the excitement of labor law and of employment discrimination law that how you assisted them in their careers. There are people in this room who will tell you they are where they are because Bill Gould suggested to them different courses in life, that you've stayed in touch with them over the years, that they say that you have great empathy for their academic and their personal needs, uh, and then when they needed assistance, you were there for them. Looking back on this, I mean, how do you feel that success in impacting so many people's lives as a professor? Well, uh, I'm very appreciative of, 
of those kinds of comments. I, I think, as my wife would tell you, uh, uh, you know, there's this character, uh, uh, most of the students seem unfamiliar with him these days, uh, called Mr. Chips. <laughs> Mr. Chips. I, 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 Mr. Chips, I am not. Um, uh, Mr. Chips was a wonderful uh, uh, character who uh, just was involved deeply. As, as my colleague, uh, uh, some of you may know him, uh, Herman Levy at Santa Clara Law School, he was Mr. Chips. So, Mr. Chips on that. But I, I have, I have, uh, uh, you know, I have a, uh, a passion for uh, what I'm doing, and I, and I do have. Uh, I have been able to form, uh, I think, uh, reasonably uh, good relationships with a, a number of students uh, uh, over the years. Uh, you know, as I was thinking about this talk this afternoon, I was thinking about all the uh, uh, those that uh, it's impossible really to uh, to catalog them, and uh, uh, except that I think those first few years. You had one of them up. You got a couple of them up here. Those first few years, uh, the the triumvirate. You know, uh, I don't know if he's here. Oscar Rosenblum, who was my very first research assistant here. And then Jeremiah Collins, who you saw here, and, and uh, Gary Williams, who you saw here as well. Uh, so I, I feel as though um, uh, you know there are a lot of them that uh, I've had a you know great deal of contact with. I wish I could have brought more of them to Washington and Sacramento with me in these two uh, administrative agency jobs that I had. Uh, but um, uh, I, I suppose the, the ultimately there is a, uh, you know, this is all we can do. We can, we can uh, uh, try to uh, uh, pass something on that we have and uh, try to make uh, uh, their lives uh, 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 better and um, uh, enrich them, and uh, as uh, and we hope that we can do that about society uh, generally. And and uh, I think being here at uh, Stanford Law School uh, has uh, given me uh, a real chance to do that with these very smart. Uh, I'm just amazed, at the, you know, the number of the these kids over the years. Uh, I still call them. Kids, you know, they, 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 who uh, even though some of them are retired, uh, who have been uh, uh, who have been who, who are working with me and who I've taught, uh, whether they be research assistants or not. One, One last question from me is that you are amazingly prolific. You have written eleven books. Right now, you are working on your twelfth. If you could turn on your TV or your radio or look in the press, and there's an article about a labor law issue is that almost invariably there'll be a quote from the go-to guy from uh, the people in the press and the media, is that Bill Gould will explain a complicated labor law question in layman's terms. What's it like to be relevant after <laughs> of these years? Well, I don't want to press my luck here. <laughs> the, um, uh, but... Uh, you know, I think that one of the things that it, it, one of the things that we can do, uh, you know, I, I gave a lot of talks uh, abroad. I taught abroad in South Africa. I spent a lot of time in Japan. And um, uh, it, to make a long story short, I, I saw that there was a great need to explain this subject in uh, to, to boil it down to make it understandable. <laughs> Uh, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And uh, um, my wife said to me, you know, why don't you write a book like that? OK, all right. So that was, that's, that's how this book, A Primer on American Labor Law, uh, came about. Uh, and that's how the, all these six editions, starting in 1982 and going through 2019, came about. And that, and that was my attempt to really uh, uh, I suppose, uh, be relevant in that sense and to uh, uh, make the subject, uh, you, you know, to, to remove some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, obfuscation that otherwise is associated with it. Uh, one, uh, one last question. We have one last question, then we have a very special presentation, and Bill will make his.
closing comments. Uh, and the last question related, you mentioned that your, your experiences in Tokyo and South Africa and your, your relationship with Nelson Mandela. Uh, maybe a few words about that and how that might have affected your work here. Well, those are, uh, in terms of, I, I think I was able to bring some of that back here. Uh, I, you know, when I came back <coughs> at one point in the 90s from one of my visits to uh, South Africa, uh, I actually taught a seminar on the constitutional negotiations in, uh, in South Africa that uh, I was involved in. Cyril Ramaphosa was just a little young guy sitting in our house having lunch with us in the early 80s. And, uh, uh, and he, uh, I go back in the uh, 90s, and uh, he uh, arranges for us, arranges for me to, to sit in on the constitutional negotiations. So uh, that was terribly important. I think that um, Japan, uh, you know, I was, uh, I had an, interest in Japan since I was a, a child, since we were attacked by Japan. And um, uh, I remember my father, very patriotic friendly, but my father said, uh, you know, the United States is taking a beating in this war because they thought that the Japanese were monkeys in the trees. <laughs> That's really true. Yeah. That's really true. They thought the Japanese were monkeys in the trees, and they can't fly, fly planes. Well, you know, see, Japan did all these extraordinary things, and I was just uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I, that, that made such an impression on me. And then, of course, Japan became so successful in the 60s, after the war, in the 70s, so I had to write a book once, particularly when I found out that Japan operates under the same legal labor law system that the United States uh, uh, devised at the end of the war. MacArthur imposed that upon them. So, but it's a very, very different society. So that, that was really what my time in Japan was about. South Africa, uh, goodness, so that was uh, 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 terribly exciting. And when I first went there, the name Mandela could not be mentioned. Um, and uh, I became, some of those photos are with these guys that I met in Soweto, and uh, that I met when I first got there, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, community of the resurrection, uh, Father Huddleston's, you know, Father Huddleston who wrote, Not For Your Comfort. Uh, uh, the, I went out to the community of the resurrection and uh, met with these guys who were shop stewards and uh, trade unionists uh, who lived in Soweto, and I became uh, very friendly with them uh, at that time. Very exciting time, and of course, very exciting to be able to come back, uh, as I did, uh, not only during the constitutional negotiations once Mandela was freed, but uh, then uh, uh, when, when the new system, the new government came in. Thank you. Well, now I get to have some fun. Hopefully you will be, if I don't fall over this. Well, I think I will. Uh, I do have something very special, very special to read. Uh, okay, close to my mouth. Uh, <laughs> Let me read this. It reads like this. Dear Bill, I'm delighted to join your family, friends, colleagues, and many admirers in congratulating you as you celebrate 50 years on the faculty of Stanford Law School. Throughout your legendary tenure, you've dramatically advanced the study and practice of labor and discrimination law, helping to make our nation fairer and stronger. Along the way, you have earned the respect of all who know you for your passion for, the passion for the law, your academic scholarship, and your generous mentorship of countless students. Of course, I will always be grateful 
that I could convince you to spend four years in Washington as the chairman of the National Labor Relations Board. Your outstanding service brought new vision and purpose to the NLRB at a time of momentous economic and social change, and millions are better off today because of it. And perhaps, most, of import most important of all, you saved baseball. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for all you've done throughout your life and career to move America forward. You have my very best wishes for many, many more years of health, happiness, and fulfillment. Sincerely, Bill Clinton. <laughs> Okay, I'm on, okay. Well, the, the hour is late. Um, and uh, let me just uh, try to uh, conclude fairly uh, briefly. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much all for making this possible, and particularly uh, uh, these two gentlemen up in the front, uh, Alan and Richard, who uh, Richard I had met uh, once uh, a few times as uh, when he was a visitor here on the faculty, and I didn't know either of them until they uh, were in touch with me about uh, the thing that they put together for Felton a year ago, and then uh, I was very surprised and honored uh, that uh, that they would do this for me. I would say. Uh, uh, briefly this, uh, that uh, uh, as I look back on these 50 years and uh, the years before this, um, I am very lucky, very lucky. Um, I got a lot of breaks, a lot of breaks uh, in life. I got, first of all, parents who uh, gave me a very good environment. Um, they believe